So thank you for having me here. It's been a few years since I've been here talking about something from our past. So uh, it's been a while. And, and yes, my son and daughter-in-law are here. After. He's not a landscape architect. Uh, but he did, he did get a, a master's in historic preservation. So I'm very proud of him for that. But now they're both doing his software development. So uh, loving that more. So I can't imagine not wanting to be a landscape architect. Uh, the firm, as, as Roger mentioned, the firm has downsized considerably. Uh, we were planning this before the, the, the shutdown and the pandemic. Uh, but it's been great. You know, we have still about 10 or 12 projects that I'm going to be finishing up, so I'm not going anywhere, and I will continue to, to do work as a landscape architect as long as I can. I love doing it. Um, but this was a, a project that started about four years ago. And so it's continuing. It, it's been kind of these stops and starts over the last four years, and that in itself is a whole presentation. But uh, anytime you deal with the California Coastal Commission, the San Diego Unified Port District, and the City of San Diego, and the Midway Foundation, it can get really complicated. So, not with me today is Dennis Osuji. Dennis has worked for me for the last 10 years, that pretty close to his firm, ONA, and uh, has been a great mentor and colleague. And, about four years ago, he started working on this in terms of the logistics to really achieve a, well, let me go back a second. The Midway, when it was birthed in 2004, the promise by the Midway to the Coastal Commission was that they would convert the Navy Pier into a park. Okay, so, you know, nobody knew if Midway was going to survive, and, you know, there was all sorts of issues about getting this aircraft carrier ready for touring as, as a museum, but nevertheless, it was able to, uh, you know, be very successful, but they never got to that parking thing. And of course, if any of you, probably all of you, have been to the Midway to, to go see the museum, you park on the pier. And today, it has about 500 plus or minus stalls, and they're used pretty much full time. So, the agreement was that there'd be zero parking under the Coastal Commission <laughs> agreement and the Midway was using the pier for parking. And at the time, there wasn't much parking elsewhere. Well, that's fast forward, it's changed, and then the Coastal said, well, you still gotta get rid of the parking. So we really started, and this is where Dennis came in. He really worked with all of the in individuals and the staff and agencies to, well, let's negotiate from 500 stalls down to, you know, not getting to zero, and because they still needed to have some parking. So, just last summer, after three and a half years, we finally got the Coastal Commission to agree on reducing the parking down to 100 stalls. Not just for the need for parking, but there is a whole logistical and staging requirement. If you can imagine, when you see the Midway, you see all these beautiful aircraft up on the, on the deck, it's like, how do you get them up there? Well, the area that you're gonna see in the park that we designated, that's also a staging area where the big cranes come in and they lift the planes and the helicopters off the deck. So that was crazy in itself to realize that happened. And this is not just a pier park, and there's pier parks all over the world. They're, they're very popular right now, so probably started in New York and in Seattle. But this one has an aircraft carrier berthed at it. A little different. Plus, the Navy Pier is still not owned by the Navy, but the Navy has 24-7 uh, access rights to that pier for emergency situations. So imagine where the Hornblower cruise ships are on the north side, they can be kicked out and you can see naval destroyers in there. So, don't know when that would need to happen, but nevertheless, that was a requirement. So there's a lot of restrictions. So as I mentioned, we finally got down to 100 stalls for parking and began to kind of in earnest to look at the design because up to that point, we were just kind of doing green park and gray for asphalt, so. Um, so anyway, today, uh, the other collaborator on this project was a group out of New York, Gallagher and Associates. They're museum exhibit designers. I think they've been doing the, uh, the Comic Con Museum. So they were brought in to begin looking at ways to put up a series of outdoor museum exhibits. So we actually worked with them. And this just started back in probably September. So they developed their 
ideas and we developed ours and we're trying to collaborate. And I think what you're gonna to see today is a combination of both their ideas and our ability to take those ideas and turn it into a park. Because obviously at the end of the day, Wilson Commission said it's going to be a 100% public park on the pier with very limited parking. So anyway. Uh, no, so here. Oh. <laughs> Did you turn it off? Did I turn it off? Maybe the battery. Maybe the battery. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the audio. Maybe we get something else. Let's try this one. Let's try this one. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Continue. <laughs> so, one of the ideas that Dennis had when he started working with Mac, and, and let me go back another ten years. I actually started working with Midway in developing the uh, the park for the unconditional surrender, otherwise known as the Kiss. And so that was our first collaboration with Mac and his crew, and that was in itself, you know, quite an achievement to get that out there. And I know a lot of people lose love and hate relationships, but, you know, it's been very popular. So Mac kind of knew how to get things done when he had a mindset to do it. And being a retired naval admiral, he knew very well how to get things done. So we began to think about what this would be named. And the reason I'm talking about the, the KISS is I'll show you at the last one of the last images. The idea is that Mac's vision was not just having a pier as a park, it was really taking everything from where the fish market is, all the way down and around the stern of the ship, and um, into the, the, the park itself, the pier park. And Dennis, being a Vietnam veteran, said, you know, we need to do something to really contribute to the, the veterans of San Diego. So it really became, the first name was Veterans Park. And the idea was that the park would be centered around celebrating and you know talking about the, the San Diego presence of the military and all of the different services here in this region and what it's done for San Diego. Fast forward, it's now called Freedom Park at Navy Pier. So it's still based on that premise of, of recognizing how we have freedom, why we have freedom, and how much San Diego has played as part of that. So anyway, this is a uh, minute. Um, what you see here is a sign in the front saying Freedom Park. The element to the left, I just want to talk about now because it's hard to see later in the presentation. If you've been down there today, there's a giant warehouse building. It's actually like one half of what it used to be. It used to go all the way down to the pier. And this pier has an amazing amount of history. It has history going back to the 30s and 40s and 50s. And you know, it didn't start out as the big pier. It was added on to, taken apart. The center portion of the pier is actually over dirt. It sits on a mole just like what we call the G Street Mall, same thing. It's basically sitting on a mall, and it's surrounded by retaining walls. And then the area outside edge, which is all concrete, that's actually over the piers. So it's kind of an unusual, it's not a freestanding pier. But anyway, this warehouse that was on there also has its own history. It was, I've been told, that Rosie the Riveter did work there, and they stored tanks up and down the two stories it sits, and it's, it's just this giant, heavy, three-foot wall building, thick wall building. So I said, well, there's history there too. So working with some of the Midway staff, I was able to get all these historical pictures and we kept seeing how this pier was used for the last 70 years, 60 years. So we wanted to recognize that as part of the story. So one of the suggestions that I had was, okay, we gotta take down this building. And <laughs> it's a lot of money to take down this building. Let's leave part of it. Let's leave this little piece here. It's not quite as refined as this. It's gonna have, think of an old wall that we're saving. It's not gonna look that nice. But it's, it's kind of a remnant wall of the building. And hopefully we'll have uh, interpretive signs on it talking about what happened in this building. And You know, there, there is a lot of history down there. We can't just say it's a public. This is not a public park in the sense that it's a passive or active park. This is a park that's really has a whole different meaning to it. And things like this are what we're trying to use to, to focus on that. So let's see if this works. Okay, here we go. So anyway, looking back, freedom will come into this image imagery quite a bit. So for instance, here I said, you know, well, we're going to have Freedom Park. We have to have a freedom tree. So, oh, by the way, the, the Coastal Commission also said the entire landscape on this park had to be native. 
Now, just having completed another project in South Bay, an RV park down in South Bay where the Gala was being built, that was the first project we were told that had to be native. And I thought, gosh, an RV park, campers, kids, dogs, nothing's going to survive. Um, but I worked with Patrick Montgomery down at Native West Native uh, Plant Nursery, it used to be Recon Plant Nursery, and we really developed a palette. So I've become to understand, okay, you can use natives in a very careful, logistical way. So in this case, everything you see is going to be, in, I wouldn't say native in San Diego, it's going to be indigenous California. So for instance, here is a Monterey Cypress. It's going to be a specimen and hopefully it will give this that sense, I have to find one this big, that's a big part. Um, but it's going to be a way to begin to recognize the, the, the reference of the name of the park being the park. Okay, so it's a Joni Mitchell song, tear up a park and put in a parking lot. Yeah. I'm doing the opposite. I feel, I feel good about this. I mean, we, Mac didn't want to lose all those parking stalls, but I said, you know, the end result's going to be pretty good. Because we're going to still have parking, but we're going to put a park on top. Who does that? So obviously the entrance and exit out of Harbor Drive has to be considered. So the building is today where this image is shown. And it basically, you know, there's only a one way in, one way out. So this will allow a, a uh, this will also line up with, I think it's East Street. So it'll go right into downtown. So these two roads coming in will orient you into the project and there'll be parking in the center of the, of the park. Uh, again, there's lots of opportunities here for problems with pedestrians and vehicular traffic, but that's today too. So hopefully in this case, the, the, the walkway going back and forth actually is the promenade that's there today. So we're actually adding park to the west of the promenade and then of course the park to the back. The area now, again, the other point out here is what you see at the very end of this pier is a very large American flag. That was Dennis's idea. Originally, we were going to have the American flag and all six service flags, but we thought, well, let's at least get the American flag. And Max said it's going to be the biggest blank flag in the, you've ever seen. You know? So that's that's why it's at the end of this road. If you see it from downtown, you'll see it from the bay. It's going to be a big flag. So. Um, Again, working with Gallagher, trying to develop ways to commemorate freedom and what it means to us, uh, we have the Steps of Freedom. And the Steps of Freedom actually are going down this, this 900 foot long, 30 foot wide promenade that goes along the north side of the pier. And that's also a requirement of having nothing that you can see, there's not a whole lot of landscape on that side because that's where the Navy needs to be able to bring their ships in, okay? So in this case, we have the Steps of Freedom. Here's a, a quote from Dwight Eisenhower, uh, President Dwight Eisenhower. And so it's, it's again, taking advantage of those ways to recognize, and that's what Gallagher does really well. Now, also, it was emphasized by Coastal that we wanted a green park. We wanted a park that's sustainable. We wanted a park that recognizes our environment. So. What I'm trying to do is build into that. So you can see some images here. There's some Dracena Dracos, dragon trees, and you know we're trying to get things that people see around here. These benches, which are a little hard to see here. Um, I worked with the Urban Timber uh, a couple of years ago, Monica Moraz and I, on the development of these benches that were made out of recycled wood that was eucalyptus trees from Bevel Park. We put them on the deck that I designed under the Morton Bay fig tree, and the Friends of Elba Park got a lot of money for those. So it was a good fundraiser. So I said, you know, I saw a project up in San Francisco called Tunnel Top Parks, which just opened last summer. And it basically is a is a park that's built over the one-on-one -on -one tunnel from the Presidio all the way down to the Bay. And James Cuomo Field Operations, who did the High Line in New York, did that project. And I was so impressed. They had these beautiful driftwood seating. I wouldn't call them benches, but they're seating elements. They look like giant whales. So I said, well, we could do something like that down here. So this is just an in image at this point, but we're working with Urban Timber to kind of come up with ways to use eucalyptus. And believe it or not, eucalyptus is some of the, it's not good for a lot. But one of the good things is that it's very dense and very tight and it's excellent against marine environments. So we're going to make some of these benches out of eucalyptus and have those along the way. So that begins to kind of soften 
um, what otherwise is, is a pretty industrial looking pier. Um, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for seating. We're going to have a lot of areas where there's shade. Uh, you can begin to see kind of where there's bike parking and, you know, there's parking behind this. You can look through there and see the cars, but we really try to, to hide the parking so it's not so obvious. When you come to the west end of the pier, you can see here on the upper left, that's the parking area. You'll see it plan view a little bit. The idea is you come down this promenade and it just splays out at the end out to the pier. And what I wanted to do is kind of create just this open knoll. It's a grass, and I'm using real grass. People keep asking me, is that going to be artificial turf? <laughs> no, it's going to be real grass, and I know which variety I'm going to use because it's going to be tolerant out there. And it's large enough. There's a lot of stuff going on right now on it, but the idea is that it's just an open grass area. These are actually going to be another idea that I got from the Presidio in San Francisco. Just these giant seat table play things that are just sitting around. They're not attached, they're not built, there's no play uh, structures. It's just kind of like, you know, set it up every day the way you want. And the people enjoy that. So this is actually uh, this the largest area for turf out front. The, the park splays out uh, to the end of the pier. You can see the steps that continue on. Then we come to the end of the pier, and there's the, there's the American flag. Pretty big. Uh, another, you can get it bigger. Uh, you can get it bigger. I know I can. <laughs> but the structural engineer is going to be really hard to work with on this. There's a giant Mexican flag just south of the border. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's huge. It's huge. It's so huge. Will this be that big? Well, they have different structural engineers down there. So, <laughs> so anyway, this is what, what's interesting here is, is you have this, this flag that's visible from hopefully all points. And again, another idea that Gallagher had, and I, I loved it because I, I did something like this on another project, is these are core 10 steel panels. So this is going to be a, a, I keep looking at this, and I'm right here. So this is going to be a art sculpture, and, and it's perforated metal, core 10 steel metal, where the sun will come in, and this will be the words of freedom. So the words of freedom will be embossed on the, on the ground. Also, my night lighting will do the same thing. Now, this other little item here that you're wondering, what the heck are those? Those are our, uh, I, I, I was calling them couple swings or, or something, but someone came up and said, no, the naval term is, those should be porthole swings. I thought, okay. But they're just something, the, the, port, the coastal was really pushing us to have some sort of structured play elements. I said, well, this is not for that, but I could see this. People can sit out there. <laughs> My concern is making sure these are back far enough so people don't try to do the swing in the bed. <laughs> so, don't, don't give them ideas, right? So, yeah, we, that's a detail. We'll have to work that out. Behind that grass knoll is I, this is where I, I really appeased the, the folks at the coastal, is I created a native garden. And this is called the Garden of Memories. So here, you're going to have much more passive. It's decomposed granite. We're going to do some recycled wood seating, all native plant palette, uh, lots of seating. I've got more seating in this park than you can imagine because that's, that's a big part of making it a really good passive park. This is an element at the end of the pier just behind the, the Garden of Memories. Again, the pier with its history, it often was used for births of ships coming in and going out, and families, friends, were saying either hello or goodbye to the sailors going off to off to war or out to sea. So we want to do something, and this kind of came in my mind from when we did. Now we didn't do it, but the Bob Hope sculpture, which is much more. You know, it's kind of the same thing, and Bob's there speaking, and you get that sense. And so to think of that and scale that, and that would be something that we're going to do here. Again, we'll probably, on these art elements like this, Gallagher will be developing some of the actual technical exhibits, but we're going to be working with local artists and trying to get you know, these built. So again, as I mentioned, you're coming into the parking area here. You can begin to see the parking. What we've tried to do is to shade the parking all the way around as best we can. Uh, there's looking over the top of this, this end piece. Uh, someone referred to it as a football. I guess it does have that shape. Uh, again, lots of seating, lots of seat walls. Again, remember that the pier is flat, and what we're going to do is actually build everything up from the pier deck. And 
Oh yeah, by the way, not one single drop of water can fall into the bay. <laughs> so that's another detail. But we're basically going to try to help save as much of the water. We're going to use pervious paving and, and landscape areas to collect the water, hopefully store some of the water for the irrigation use, but basically clean it before it goes off to the storm sewer. But it'll also be taken off the deck back to the, to the mainland. Here's one of the, the only intersection that I was worried about, but we had to try to connect these park elements, is this one goes right across the middle of the park. So we'll have to figure out how we're going to be able to keep the people and the cars separate. But it's a pretty wide promenade, again, it's about 35 feet, so it should be able to be controlled, and hopefully cars aren't going much past 5 or 10 miles an hour. This is the front of the park, and this is the parade ground. We call it the parade ground because it's reminiscent of what is at Liberty Station. And Dennis actually was a landscape architect at Liberty Station, so he did a lot of that work in the restoration of the NTC, working with the McBellan companies years ago. So the idea here is that this would be an area that is used for ceremonies or formal events. You know, they have like four or five hundred events every year already on the Midway, but in this case, they need more room. So this would become kind of an overflow for that. So this area will, it's pretty much flat. You can kind of see in the background there, the building wall, remnant wall piece. This is um, the gentleman, his name is John Finn, I'm a set officer with the Navy. And he actually uh, was from San Diego, Chula Vista, just passed away a couple of years ago. Mac and I have been trying to get a place for a statue of John Finn for the last three or four, five years now. Got shot down a few times by the Port Art Committee and others, but anyway. Remember, behind the, the museum, from the fish market all around, there's already a number of existing memorials. And that's kind of why the whole thing is tied together. So, but John Finn is unique, is that he was the only enlisted, off, enlisted uh, am I saying it right? When you're not an officer, you're enlisted, right? Not commissioned. Not commissioned. Uh, in Pearl Harbor. And he's the only San Diego that ever won the, the Medal of Honor. So, Mac has been tried, and I said, Mac, I found a place for Mr. Finn. So, we put him right smack in the middle um, of this parade ground. So, there you can see it from above. So, he's in the center, and we basically have uh, the parade ground area. There's um, you know, opportunity for all sorts, of, and there are lots of seating around here. Some of the seating doesn't show here, but again, we see this as a very active place. You could have you know, ceremonies. Uh, presentations, uh, events, you name it. And the Midway has had to make a number of concessions with the Coastal Commission to allow for a lot of different things to happen. Basically, you know, they could use the different places for private events up to 10 or 15% of the time, but for the most part, it's all public, so. We have to have a food concession somewhere. That was a Coastal Commission requirement. So, I, I put a place for one, we joke about this because Mac used to complain about not having a good taco shop nearby, and he always says, let's just put a Mac's taco stand out at the end of the pier. Well, this is more petite, but it's Mac's taco shop. Uh, so we don't know sure what it'll look like. This is a little industrial looking thing, but uh, you know, we'll have that opportunity. And then here's the uh, kind of overview of the top. And I want to, this is kind of where I want to go back to that idea that the, the park really starts, you know, everyone knows what the kissing statue is by the, by the uh, fish market. So just follow that all the way around along the promenade of the back out of the pier. So it really is a much larger park in the vision, but right now this design is just going to focus on converting the pier. It doesn't seem like Oops. just the one um, top of the statue is going to be enough for that whole thing. Probably not. So yeah, there should be lots of people. Okay. Well, we hope, right? Yeah. But And so I'm sure there'll be other things, pop-ups and other things that'll happen, but okay. we needed to get at least one okay. and into the design. And, you know, when you get a design done with the Coastal Commission, it's got to be like, okay, everything is spelled out. But we figured there'll be other opportunities. I mean, it's obviously something the Coastal Commission wants to see is activity. Right. Everywhere we can. So I'm sure a lot of things, and, and I try to allow for there's plenty of space to do pop-ups and other things that might be able to go out there, but, you know, kiosks. Uh, okay. But yeah, it was... in San Francisco, some of their parks have days when food trucks come in. Exactly. So, 
Thank you. I can park about 20 food trucks on that promenade. And still have parking, still have walkability. So yes, that's how we, we, we plan food trucks, buses, shuttles, everything that would fit in here. And then again, remember, as I said earlier, the reason the parking's in the middle is where all the trains go. Okay, I had to go here. So we can go here, we can go here. So this kind of drove the whole park. So you got, you got, you know, different needs than you would on a typical park, right? So we had to work with that. So that is there, did you have to build a public restroom into the park? Yeah. Yes. A location for one. Another detail. It's right here. Okay. Right behind the, the, the playground. Reason it's there yeah. is service is both. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully it's close enough to the entrance and exit of the midway. Of course, midway certainly has uh, their facilities. But yeah, we had to provide that. It's you know, family style. I'm sure you know. Midway's not open all the time. Yeah. And you have to yeah. pay to go on it, don't you? On the museum, yes, but not the park. Yeah. The park's but not, yeah. but not to go up to the viewpoint area. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, Mr. AV expert, I was going to start the video, but I didn't get the sound, so. <laughs> so we did a little animation, and I just said it's a couple minutes long, I'm just going to show you the whole thing in context, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Okay. Whenever I show this, I have to hold back because I want to tell you what everything is. I'm supposed to. It took us like a week to find that soundtrack, so it's like, <laughs> I had to give her credit. And another gentleman who used to work for us, Ray Robledo. Uh, that, this is a program, the software for those tech techies out there. This is software called Lumion, which is pretty common now, but I was able to bring it in about six, seven years ago. So we've been doing these animations, and we keep getting better at it. This is all done in-house, literally, in-house, in my house. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, thank you. I, it, it's going to be uh, a challenge, but we'll, we'll, uh, we have five years to do it, so. Yeah, I was just going to ask what the timeline was. Yeah, five, five years is the commitment to have it open. 
Now, again, the agreement really was in question about the 20 year mark, which will be next year. So we have to actually have construction started by next year. So that's why I'm going to be starting, already started, sitting down with our engineering and their staff trying to come up with the details of how to get this built. So, yeah. Just a suggestion. Yes. It would be nice to see something towards the Native Americans. Yeah. Because there hasn't really been anything. So either code talker statues or something along that line. Thank you for bringing that up. That, that's an excellent question. One of the one of the elements that so ever heard everyone's heard about the metaverse, right? <laughs> so you had this physical park, but again, Gallagher. This is one of their strengths because of the museum exhibit technology. Is there's going to be QR codes everywhere because the idea is that they're going to enliven this park with. Just as you said, experiences, uh, people talking. It's kind of like the Bob Hope, except in uh, a different form. You know, they're going to really build that in, and it's so the park will have an opportunity to grow to continue to to do these. Again, it was uh, you know the whole idea of bringing in that you know the native of everything, you know, yeah. plants, people, you know, into this park design. So that was what Coastal was really pushing. Coastal's not you know they're. They're focused on that, you know, veterans, okay, whatever, you know, they're, they're, but we were able to combine that and the ideas like Gallagher, and this is unique because very seldom, you know, I've done a lot of parks and obviously never worked on a park with a museum exhibit uh, consultant, but they bring a lot to the table, yeah. it's going to be fun. A couple, couple questions, uh, number one, as you plan this project, Owen Lang, when he came out to do a uh, appraisal of the pier and what could be done on the pier, one of the options was to put the parking below grade yes. because it is a mall. Yes. So the question was, could you put the parking under the park and then have a whole park on top? Now I do understand the need for the space for the for the elevators and the cranes. Uh, that did make sense to me when I read the proposal. Yes. But, uh, but I'm just wondering whether that was looked at. Absolutely. Number two, this is at least the third plan that the Midway and the Port have put forward and the, port com the Coastal Commission approved, but never got built. And I know the Coastal Commission was putting pressure on the Port and the Midway is this just another plan on paper, or is this one going to actually get built? What, <laughs> what, is, what, monitoring, what monitoring enforcement effort have you seen on the part of the Coastal Commission to make sure it gets built? Got and it. then last is, tell me a little more about the role of Mac, because I know this is his swan song. He's retiring this year, and I've kind of been interested to see how he came around and decided that this was what he was going to leave. That's his legacy. Okay, so three questions. <laughs> the first one is yes, we looked at several times. Again, remember, three years of this process was the parking. Above ground, below ground, sideways, on top, next to. Uh, Dennis, God bless him, he's a very patient man. You know, it was just a struggle of trying to come up with ways to do this. And, and, and it really was, it was looked at. But it was just from an expense and from a structure standpoint, it's like spending $50 million on the infrastructure and $10 million on the park. Right. So that was the main reason why it was just not going to get there. And it really came down to a timing issue because again, we needed to have this agreement in place before they can go forward. This agreement had in the post emissions mind, commission's mind was supposed to be done. Twenty years ago. Second point. There's been at least three designs for this, if not more. But the first one, two, three endeavors that I'm familiar with were never even, two of them were never presented Coastal, none of them were ever, never approved by Coastal. The Port District has been partnering with the Midway on this effort. So Port District and Midway are partners. So we didn't have a problem with the Port District, but the Port District was also under pressure by the Coastal to get this done. So, um, and some of those ideas are pretty grandiose. And I read the, the, the recaps from different, even the Port Commission's comments on why this 
plan wouldn't work, why that design was just too costly, and whatever, whatever. So it came down to, okay, we got one more shot at this. And remember, and mentioning Mac, we have one more shot where Mac's in charge. And Mac has been, you know, when they interviewed for this position 20 years ago, there were five applicants. Mac said, I'm the, I'm the one who was dumb enough to take it. Because no one thought it would, it would work. Fast forward, when Mac announced his retirement last fall, there were 500 applicants. So it, suddenly everyone realizes this is a place to be. So there was a, there was a race that we had to get to here because we we're gonna lose Mac in his capacity. We we're also going to lose uh, a few other staff. Uh, some at the port was retiring, some at Coastal was retiring. So we said, you know, if we don't get this thing done now, <laughs> it's like when Mac gave orders to get this done, you know, that's why the last six months were pretty crazy. So yes, but Mac is, this is really what I consider to be the tenacity of Mac McLaughlin having a ability to using his experience in, in the Navy and elsewhere to really okay I know how to negotiate I mean I saw this in a much smaller scale when we did the Kiss statue because you remember how kind of controversial that was mm -hmm. but not only was it controversial so how do you get money for this Mac was amazing at what he did to get that thing done and go through and I sat with him at these art committees and other groups and trying to sell even with the John Finn statue so if anything, I just said, Mac, bite your lip and don't say anything more because he can, you know, he can get into the salty sailor talk really quick. And he did behind the scenes on this. And again, a lot of this was done on Zoom. Oh boy. <laughs> Zoom itself is just allowing that you better mute the button. You know, don't, <laughs> uh, or turn off your screen. But uh, Mac lasted through it. And yeah, he was, uh, he's actually, his, his uh, last day was February, March 3rd, I think. So he's actually already uh, on a retirement home. Right? Yeah, so he's, he'll, he'll be back. He'll be down working on a plane. Yeah, he will be. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. Mac is just, I just love working, not only Mac, but some of the staff he has uh, out on uh, Midway. But again, back to your question, the, 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 the strength of the Midway today, it's a great museum, it's one of a kind, but the docents are what really make the Midway successful. Now, understanding most of the docents are in their senior years. So that idea to take some of those stories, and maybe someday, I saw this in 60 Minutes once, a hologram of somebody that you know, you're asking questions to. So that's where the park has that next level that hasn't even been designed yet, but it doesn't have to be physically built. It can be built into the technology of the park. So did I get all three questions? Yeah. Okay. There's some here. Speaking of technology, is there adaptions made now that e-bikes are so popular? I'm sorry. That electric bikes are so popular. And how does right. your traffic? Yeah, we, we have a, we we have some details to work out with the pedicabs, the electric bikes, the, you know, the scooters, the, you, know, you name it. So yeah, I mean, I think the overall premise on this park is that the Midway is going to commit for per perpetuity to help maintain the park and manage the park, even though it's a public park, it's a city, for, it's a port park. The Midway is committing to this, and there's been a lot of questions about how you can control traffic, how you're going to keep, you know, homeless from encampments out there. I mean, all these different questions come up. You know, how the restrooms going to be locked or open? You know, there's a lot there to deal with. But at the end of the day, I think there's basically, in my experience, the more activity you can create around something, the less problems you have, and you also have to have the enforcement factor in there too. So I expect, and believe me, I, you know, there was a lot of discussions about. You know, how we're going to have to not only uh, take care of the park, but also maintain the park. So actually, the Midway is also committing a, a, a uh, annual budget just to help do the landscape maintenance. Because again, we're talking about a park on a pier, not going to be the easiest thing to maintain. So, okay. I know. How tall is the statue for, of, Miss, of uh, Finn? Uh, about seven feet. Well, on top of a pedestal. Not a tall guy. It's actually there's actually a sculpture sculptor that's already that was a 3D sculptor image that I used and it was actually designed by a local sculptor about he's not local he's been back east back south southeast about five years ago four years ago so it's it's bronze it's you know the whole there was one where the guy was he was on one of the ships shooting the guns at the at the aircraft so one of the first images was him holding. 
<laughs> yeah, that wasn't going to work, uh, especially with the art commission. So, but you know, so that's where, it's at. and I'm going to make the assumption that's still the case. But again, I'm not sure how Matt handed that off. But yeah, yes. Um, you know, the whole area seems to be becoming sort of a graveyard of statues all over the place, yeah. and everything, and sort of a mishmash of commemorations and memorials. Um, so I was thinking that there is, there's not a lot of um, realistic statues, not much in the way of really artistic creation. So yeah. I, um, that's one question is about how to promote that. But the other thing is looking forward as new people need to be memorialized or wars or something. How have you built into long-term uh, expansion or, or placement of new things in the early years in the future? Well, it's definitely going to be a challenge because you have so much that's existing today. I mean, you compare to some of those uh, monuments, and of course we all know what happens when you have, especially war memorials and individual recognitions, it's like once they're in place, they're kind of hard to move. But one of the ideas that Dennis had, and it shows here in terms of the, uh, you know, a lot of those, there's like two or three that exist along the harbor side, and there's three or four out here at the entrance into the G Street Mall. They're going to be, Dennis had the idea of re-landscaping. This act of the promenade landscape that you see there is not what's there today. So kind of meandering that, softening it, making it a little more respectful to those elements that are already in place. Uh, still making sure the promenade works because that's a major circulation flow. Someone mentioned Owen Lang. And I, worked, I worked with Owen on, we did the headquarters together. Okay. Uh, when he did master plan and I came in and did that. And we were always talking about this whole, and I worked with Owen, uh, at ASLA, I gave him some honors there. I felt about it. So uh, Owen and I go, I have much respect for Owen. He knows what he was doing. And good man. So. Yeah, so about the point about the, Gallagher has all sorts of ideas how to continue to commemorate people that want to be recognized. I think, and this is something Max said, which is very important, and I agree 100% having grown in San Diego, is that it's not just about the people that served, it's about the families and the community. And he wanted to make sure that we were not, you know, for instance, going to fundraising mode. You didn't want to go to, uh, you know, all the typical DOD contractors and say, we want money for this. He really wanted this to become a community-based effort and to recognize not just what uh, our service people have provided and the history in San Diego, but also about how the community is supported. So I think what you're going to find is, yes, we have to kind of work with what we have, but going forward, I think it's going to be a lot more focus on how this park, why why are we free? Freedom is not free. You know, you've heard all the, the you know, references, and the idea here is that this is going to be uh, a, a recognition of not just the military in San Diego uh, and the safety that the military brings us as a country, but the fact that, you know, this is our, you know, this is our little contribution, a big contribution to what we have done. So, yes. The sculptures at the end of the pier, the individuals that you're doing, are those in bronze and also do they depict certain periods of history? And if so, are you going to have that? That's going to be a challenge there. Yet to be determined. It's a placeholder. Again, to get the Coastal Commission's approval, we basically had to have placeholders for each of these things and a little bit about it. You know, So there was, there's, there's a, there's a, a company document that Gallagher did that goes into more detail. Like there's there's a number of places, and I didn't go into it on the presentation, but there's there's a lot of interpretive signs and exhibits for the, you know, so walking across the steps of freedom, there's these, these panels that have come across and interactive type of, of history and, and, and just understanding. But there's going to be, um, the hope is that, for instance, that statue on the end, that, that sculpture at the end, it was basically a placeholder where we wanted it. How it becomes, you know, I use the reference to the Bob Hope sculptures. Ideally, they'd be bronze. You know, the kiss is bronze, but it's painted. How, how tall is the kiss, by the way? 55 feet. Yeah. I think from, yeah. Depending where you sit. You know, in the, <clears throat> the Bob Hope yeah. area, 
That's fantastic. And when they first put it in and the daughter came out and all this kind of stuff, they had a book that told all the history of every single statue and all represent something. Now there's nothing. And kids that show up, you know, they run up there, they don't have a clue who Bob Hope was right. or what he did. So I wish that the port would put back something, but not everybody uses little QR scan. Yeah. I can't yep. I, there, there's going to have to be mixed modes of, of communication, whether it's electronic, whether it's book form, or whether, you know, yeah, I see that. I know that Gallagher is always trying to balance that with how much is written on a, on a you know, uh, an exhibit board versus how much is off your iPhone. Of course, you go to a museum today, you basically walk around with your iPhone now. So, I mean, it's, there's a way to, to try to keep both methods of communication there, but Again, the the beauty here is that you know if you if you appreciate the technology side of this is you, everything can be updated every day yeah. you know, in theory. So it, it certainly gives you that that flexibility. So yes, a couple of questions. Uh, one is I didn't see any um, indication of lighting. I'm what, you know. <laughs> what your thoughts were about that? Um, and the we second, pur we purposely. Any part of that is that it? Question. No, the, and then the second part is the. Uh, it's nice to see the entrance road really lined up with East Street. Yeah. Uh, but it looks awfully wide. It's probably it. it's it's two uh, two double lanes in. Uh, yeah, it, it is wider than we would like to have seen. But again, that whole issue of the parking and getting those big cranes and the trucks and all that other stuff. That's everything is. Believe me, every square foot of this park has been designed to accommodate something that you probably don't see very often. So, yeah, it was, but the other point about the, uh, lighting. lighting. Purposely, it's not shown, because that was another review that the Coastal Commission conducts at a future point. So we will be working with Rick Engineering and BSE now to develop the lighting plan that goes on top of this. There are restrictions and requirements, certain amount of lumens and Kelvin and all the other criteria that Coastal because again we're talking about a bay and environment, uh, so that'll have to go through its own whole separate review. My hope is that yes, there'll definitely be lighting on the flag and elements that this, this park should just sparkle at night. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be aware and sensitive to the fact that it's still over a natural bay, and we have to make sure that we don't do anything to you know put too much light in the water and, and all of that. So yeah, it's. That's going to be another uh, chapter that we're just about to get into. I have ideas about what I'd like to see. And again, as a landscape architect, I tend to like to have the lighting more, you know, don't see the source as much as you see the light. But, you know, we'll have to have, there's going to be, this park is, is, I'm not sure if they're going to have hours on it or not. And to the other question, I'm sure there will be. But you still have to provide lighting 24-7. So, <coughs> wish us well on that one. <laughs> yes. uh, I could get fresh and looking at this, there's an awful lot of cave in my comment saying about those wide entrance roads. Yeah. Doesn't seem even for a crane even that wide. And also there's a big uh, paved area up in the near the bow of the uh midway. Right. Well, that is well this is the Dobson. Oh, this right here? Yeah, so that, yeah. good Dobson. point. Thank you. There's a leasehold that the midway has power over for its as long as the midway is there. And that basically starts, kind of hard to see from this. So it starts about right here and goes all the way along the south side to the end. So they have their own parking area. There's like 30 stalls. That was loud. 45. Stay. 45. Oh, okay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to ask you how you and so on. So, but yeah, that's, that's part of the leasehold. That is not, none of that's touched. I say it's not touched. It's not touched by the park. It will be improved upon by the midway because you know you did improvements they've been making over the years. There's going to be more improvements made, but that's their property. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Pat, so, um, on the local the garden. Yes. What do you call it, the memorial garden? Garden of memories. Garden of memories. What kind of landscape are you going to have? Flowering trees, or are you going to have shrubs, or what? I just don't because you're over water, right? You know. Well, and I want to take this back to the point about the paving. What I'm attempting to do is 
we're going to, and it gets a little bit detailed here, but we're basically going to build a reservoir structure using a, uh, a material that's going to be able to allow the water to go through, collect, and then drain out while being stored. Under the landscape areas, under the paving areas, all the paving, my hope, as long as we keep the budget, is all pervious paving. There's no concrete on this site. There are concrete pavers, but they're not, there's not concrete or asphalt. It's literally just going right on top of the park. So that's what I'm working with various companies now to, to see how we, and I've seen it used elsewhere, and I know I can use it. I've done a lot of deck parks, a lot of uh, podium parks, so I know how to collect all that. But in terms of the, the pallet, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be native. But, you know, I spend three days a week walking the Santa Liga Lagoon since I've been, quote, retiring. And I, I spend a lot of time looking at, okay, well, I can know that lemonade berry can work, and I know that that toyon can work, and I know that this artemisia can work. So, I mean, I know what I think can work in a coastal environment, <coughs> but quite honestly, I know I can get some arbutus in there. Uh, you know, I can, there's different native species that'll give us some of the flowering characteristics, some of the seasonal change, and some of the variety. Some of it might just be, there might be in, in um, I can't show it here, but, you know, in terms of the garden itself, there'll be mounds where we can do some permanent landscape like the, some I call trees, and everything here is going to be fairly short. Coastal sage. So I can do some coastal sage, exactly. So I can do some seasonal planting there that will have to be replaced or reseeded. But that's, my goal is to, you know, it's not an ornamental landscape. It's supposed to look somewhat natural, but not ratty. But again, you know, right now, weeds look great. Right? Mm -hmm. You go outside, everything is green as can be. But right now, everything looks really nice. And the more native it is, the better it looks. You know what's going to happen in August. Right. <laughs> so, but that's why I mentioned earlier Patrick Montgomery, who is a landscape architect by training, by the way. Can't get him to make that jump, yeah. but he's working in the nursery. He has become an expert on, on, on native plants. And working with him on the RV park project, I really learned, okay, we can try these different things. And it's, it's going to be an experiment in a way, and I've already communicated that to the Midway, because, you know, it's, it's easy to make a policy that you're going to use native plants. Now it's, believe it or not, the Gaylord Resort that everyone's waiting to get built, that's supposed to be all native. I can't wait to see that. Well, at least the RV park is a good study. It's area. a good, it was, it's been a great study. Right. And I had a client on that, some communities that's got RV parks all over the country. They're, they allowed us to, to, to do it. And we've already gone through three or four different plant types saying, well, don't use this again, and this works well. And so, you know, I, I started the nursery business back in the 70s, so I always knew, well, we can, we can always learn from what's coming out. And up to, up to about 20 years ago, native plant nurseries were pretty much you know, one or two in the country. So it's a couple of regions. So now we've got a lot more experience. And again, just observation. Of, okay, I can see this. I've seen it under five or six different conditions. I've seen it under four seasons. You know, it could work. So that's why I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because that's that's kind of my. I want to make sure it does work. So on on the display, certainly the the auditory impaired and the visually impaired are a big thing to be considering. Yes. But. Uh, the other thing is, as long as you're talking to Fort District and you're losing 400 parking spaces, having something like a people mover going along the Embarcadero that funded by something somewhere along the line Details. would be a wonderful thing to have in place. I agree, 100%, 110%. Let me tell you about, it goes back to the question someone else had about the parking. Where did parking go? About midway last summer, Mac was able to speak to some of the developers doing the projects across the street. And I keep forgetting the acronym. It's IQH. IQHQ. And he felt comfortable that they were building up to about 1,800 parking spaces under that whole structure. So he talked about, well, maybe we can set up a shuttle, maybe we can do this and that. So there is planning underway that he started and it'll get finished by somebody else. But yeah, they're going to be able to need, they're going to need to bring because we're still Forcing all the parking off site. So, but they're going, they, they, that's part of the, they that was part of the commitment. Yeah. 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 That was part of the commitment. Again, next to the pretty graphics, there's a whole agreement, the CDP that was produced, and all of the things are listed in there. And I believe it's all public public information. So, again, as I said, the way made a lot of concessions, a lot of commitments to get this done. 
even at the point of, of providing, you know, like free Tuesdays in, in the museums and the park, there'll be free days at the Midway. So, Thank you. Pat, just a couple questions and then maybe a favor. Uh, the, all the plant materials, this is a mold. Yeah. You're not doing tree wells or anything like that. This is going into no. the soil that is. Everything we're doing is above, above the there. Above. We're not, in, the mole is right now under about two feet of asphalt. Oh. Underneath, yeah, so it's really, it's not even accessible and it's also saturated and it's not, yeah. So everything we're doing, we're not doing any tree, tree wells. What we're gonna do is using the seat walls. So imagine a seat wall on an area in here that's two to three foot, two foot high. Okay, that becomes the, 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 the containment. And then I have certain low growing materials around the edge on the inside of that and then we're gonna do mounding. And the mounding is where I'm going to be able to get room for the trees. So the trees will have to be sitting basically on this drainage system I talked about. Okay. And then the mounding will help bring the earth up to it. It'll be a high, it's going to be a very high quality soil. It's not going to be your typical landfill. It's going to be a, a good, it'll be a custom mix. And then one last question before the favor. And that the question would be, who's, who's responsible for maintaining all of this, a long term? Well, as I mentioned, Midway is already committed. I think it's 100000 a year. I'm not going to quote me on that. Uh, in addition to it, the port, because we all know the port's had difficulty maintaining from a landscape perspective. So there is a talk about that. I actually, my personal suggestion, and it hasn't found favor yet, but because I deal with maintenance issues, that's a you know, three-legged stool. Design, installation, maintenance. Design we control, installation, maybe, maybe not. Maintenance is where it falls off, and if it's not done right. So I, I really, Think there should be almost a separate endowment, like we do for the sculptures, in order to make sure that the element is prepared for. So if we could have some sort of an endowment in place, and it's probably not part of the fifty-two or sixty-two million dollars we can spend to help maintain this park for perpetuity. Because my mantra now is that has to be in place for any new parks anywhere being built now. If you don't have a mechanism for maintenance, it's going to fail. And you fail. The favor is, um, if you're comfortable with it, would you, I don't think Dennis Osuji is here, is he said? No, he's not here. Would you be able to share just a little bit about his background? He has a rather unique background. Maybe a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, Dennis, Dennis and I have known each other since 1984. Uh, he and Dennis and Jack actually were at Remata Associates then, left the year that I started. I started in 84, and Dennis and Jack went up and started at a And uh, but Dennis, as I mentioned, uh, he was born in internment camp. Japanese internment camp. He, he uh, was from Central California. Uh, he was in the Army. He was in Vietnam. Uh, served a full tour and uh, went back, went to Cal Poly, Pomona. And just this quiet force is all I could say. He's quiet, he's soft spoken, but boy, is he a force in everything he goes about doing. And uh, so when Jack retired uh, about 12, 13 years ago, you know, I continued, both Dennis and I served with ASLA as national president. So we, we've always stayed in touch just through the professional society. And uh, but I, I, I invited Dennis back to our office because I knew he didn't want to retire either. And so he, I set up an office next to mine. And he came in with all of his military, you know, awards of distinction and all this, you know, <laughs> And, and he also had his, his, he'll kill me if I say this, his Peanuts collection, all his Peanuts characters, you know, so, but, you know, he was like my, my live-in mentor, you know, after Joe retired, Dennis came in, and he's been uh, a right hand to us for, for uh, in many years, and uh, he got me to join uh, the, the Japanese friendship garden last year, so I'm on that board now, so I think there's a, he always has a motive <laughs> and a means. And you know he's been served. He served on the planning commission. Still serves on the planning commission. Serves on the parks and rec board. Serves and serves and serves. So I can't recognize him enough. And it was it was a point in time last summer where it was very frustrating for this because we weren't getting any way anywhere with with you know Dennis was was adamant he didn't want to give any more detail than we had to, but the coastal kept pushing, and so we had to basically. And the terms of this, and so I Dennis and Pat just finish it, just take it over now. Yeah, he says, I'll be your, I'll, I'll be over your shoulder. And uh, 
Yeah, so he's he's someone I, I, I have a great respect for. And, you know, I, I still talk to him. I talk about his, I saw him. We, we just celebrated the Cherry Blossom Festival last weekend, which was phenomenal. But he hasn't been over the garden. This is one of the best years ever. Even Dennis said that. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.